a senior curator who sold stuff from the British Museum on eBay was in charge of the Parthenon marbles. That is an awful, awful sentence. Now, as you say, it's not, it's not like he could. He's not like he could pocket the Parthenon marbles and sell them. But it's 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 just the the ethics here, the ethical argument. It looks very yes. shaky. Hello and welcome back to Watching Brief for the week of the 18th of September 2023. I am joined as ever by my co-host Mr Andy Brockman and uh, together we are continuing with our ongoing Watching Brief, our uh, self-imposed uh, <laughs> never-ending task of discussing the archaeological news of the week and bringing it here for your delectation and delight and also to expand on our conversation in the comments below uh how are you doing today andy um i'm okay i'm, I'm good thank you it's uh, it's decidedly autumnal now down here in southeast london mm -hmm. um and uh I, i've been teaching this week actually taking uh, primary school classes out into the local um in, into the local area to look at their the history they can see in their landscape okay so, yeah. and we've been sort of dodging the, we've been dodging the showers actually thankfully successfully <laughs> but um but no, it's, it's been a it's, it's been a, it's, it's been a good week so far. I hope, hopefully, um, sowing the seeds of some future archaeologists. Yeah, yeah, it's been been it's been similar here. Uh, actually, funnily enough, I did a, a day of school workshops earlier this week as well. Um, although, uh, what, what I would say is, it does feel as though someone has flicked a switch in terms of the seasons. Like, it, just over the course of a matter of days, it went from being almost unbearably summer-like to being, uh, well, downright torrential in terms of the the, the rain. Absolutely. Well, I, I should just go and turn up my heat pump. Yeah, well, precisely. Yes, yes. Um, maybe put on. Put, I might put on the big coat. Possibly. I don't. Know, we'll see. We'll see. Anyway. <clears throat> anyway. Uh, well, actually, that said, though, you must have some experience of the heat, the big coat uh, vest dichotomy. Uh, now having a uh, Macam in the family. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's a weird thing that in this country, the further north you go and the closer you get to the Arctic Circle. <laughs> Um, the fewer clothes people seem to want to wear routinely. Yeah, mm -hmm, yeah. It's a bit. It's a problem uh, in Newcastle in the middle of winter. You'll see people not wanting to have coats and sensible trousers and you know, etc. Because uh, or sensible shoes even uh, because of the cost of cloakroom fees in the clubs. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Anyway, we, we're oh, doing... is, that, is that why? Is that why they do it? Yeah. Oh, you know yeah. What? I'd I'd never worked that out. No, that's why. Okay. And then then you'll have people. I think they're called street pastors. They'll sort of go around wrapping people up like burritos in yeah. tin foil because they because they they might succumb to, to <laughs> some sort of frost or shock or something if they if they're not careful. Anyway, we're we're, we're <laughs> rambling about the weather again, and we need to stop yeah. doing this on watching brief. Anyway, we are now going to dive in to our deep dive on what has been happening at the British Museum. What on earth has been happening at the British Museum? Nothing controversial. Nothing controversial. <laughs> yes, the VM. To be fair, the, the British Museum's not been known for controversy until recently. Absolutely not. No, no, no. no. Abs abs absolutely um, not. It's it, it, Im impeccable record and uh, uh, yeah. of Essex and uh, Sussex and, yeah, Essex and, yeah, sorry, go on. <laughs> Kings Lynn, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Well, this this all began on uh, the sixteenth of August um, with the release of a press release by the British Museum, uh, which led to stories. The, f the first news story that, that gained my attention, uh, saying British Museum worker sacked over missing treasures. And uh, when I first saw this, if I'm honest, I imagined someone akin to a uh, a, a, maybe a shop worker, a cafe worker, someone who worked cleaning perhaps, or a caretaker, uh, nicking a couple of objects from here and there. Um, the the story said that items including gold, jewellery, and gems of semi-precious stones were among those missing from the museum, one of the, the UK's largest tourist attractions. The majority of the items were kept in a storeroom, the museum said. British Museum director at that point anyway, Hartwig Fisher said the museum would throw our efforts into the recovery of the objects. This is a highly unusual incident. He went on to say, I know I speak for all of our colleagues when I say that we take the safeguarding of all the items in our care 
extremely seriously. We have already tightened our security arrangements and we are working alongside our experts, outside experts, to complete a definitive account of what is missing, damaged and stolen. Now, those, those three things, missing, damaged and stolen, I seem to recall raised your eyebrow because uh, that, that's a very open-ended statement, actually. That's not um, something that, that could easily be quantified. Uh, and this was, this was, as far as the public was concerned, day one of the story. Um, is there anything that, that that struck you in the in the press release from the British Museum? Well, again, let me let, let let's look at the press release and deconstruct it mm. uh, because I mean I, I, I mean I, I I deal with the British Museum uh, comms office quite regularly, talking about m mostly actually talking about the portable antiquity scheme, which is also run out of mm -hmm. the BM. But um, so yeah, you know, I, I I I know what they like. They're very professional. They they do they do their job um, and. Everything they put out is very calculated, hmm. and on this occasion, the, the initial press release um, it, it goes with it starts with a positive, right? It says the British Museum has launched an independent review of security after items from the collection were found to be missing, stolen, or damaged. A member of their staff has been dismissed, and the museum will now be taking legal action against the individual. The matter is also under, under investigation by the Economic Crime Command of the Metropolitan Police. That basically is, this has happened, we've discovered it's happened, mm -hmm. we've acted proactively, we think we know who's responsible, and they're dealing with us and the police. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, and then in the second paragraph, they go beyond that, and they say, an independent review will be led by former trustee Sir Nigel Boardman and Lucy Dorsey, Chief Constable of British Transport Police. They will look into the matter and provide recommendations regarding future security op arrangements at the museum. They will also kickstart and support a vigorous program to recover the missing items. So again, we're going to be proactive. We're going to have a review of this because we recognise that all of you out there looking at the looking at the British Museum and thinking, wait a minute, how can this world-class museum lose stuff mm -hmm. from an inside job? We need to know why. We need to restore trust as quickly as possible. To be fair, that's probably the kindest thing people around the world were saying about this. We'll come to that later. Yes, okay. we'll come to that later. Okay. <laughs> and then the, fin then the final the final paragraph, again, is really equally instructive. Mm -hmm. says, the majority of the items in question were small pieces kept in a store and belonging to one of the museum's collections. They include gold, jewellery, and gems of semi-precious stones and glass dating from the 15th century BC to the 19th century AD. None has recently been on public display and they were kept primary, primarily for academic and research purposes. Hmm. So that is at the same time, that is also downplaying the significance of what's happened. It's saying it's only one part of this vast collection. Hmm. So it's one person hmm. and one part of this vast collection. Um, it appears not to be systematic because the material that appears to have gone is potentially randomly distributed across thousands of years of history mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um it's not our, our gallery security is absolutely fine because it wasn't on public display it's the it's the it's the back catalog that's there for academic and research academics and researchers the public so the public needn't worry about this you know it, it's um it, it, it's something that is only going to impact on academic researchers and probably not very much mm. Right. So, so, and, so very much, very oh, much kind of, you know, just, just crushing it down, keeping it small. Yeah. Not a big deal. Yeah. Apparently. It's called controlling the narrative. Yeah. Well, trying to. I'm I'm, yeah. Trying to. Um, yeah, exactly. Because as, uh, yeah, I'm sure they realized they were on a hiding to nothing when they put that out. Mm -hmm. But um, the, the fourth state being what it is, um, a, lo a lot of papers started asking questions mm -hmm. and started coming up with some answers that maybe went rather further than that press release would suggest. Yeah. Well, the Daily Mail, uh, who did, in that sense, take a lead on this story, uh, interestingly enough, said... Uh, well, that, I think, to be fair, to be fair the, the, I, know, I know a lot of people, particularly people on the, broadly speaking, the progressive side of certainly UK politics criticise the mail. In fact, its news operation uh, is is very effective. It has some very good journalists. They do mm -hmm. good research. Mm -hmm. They don't get taken to court that often because they get it right. This is true. But also the Daily Mail is known as the Daily Hile. Um, 
for reasons that we can look into if you want to uh, look into the 1940s and 50s. Um, anyway, sacked. Th th this is the headline. Revealed, sacked British Museum curator's Twitter name is same as eBay seller who flogged 70 items to whistleblower, who now says the museum director is an idiot who lives on a cloud in cloud cuckoo land. Interesting headline. Um, but this, this, this was... Uh, this for me, this this increased very much, very quickly increased the alarm at what had been going on. Uh, uh, the, the idea that the material from from the British Museum, whether it's, it was in the archive or not, had ended up on eBay, uh, I think for any sensible person that should raise alarm. Um, again, we'll talk. We'll probably talk about international reaction and the rights of those reactions uh, in a little bit. And also, as well, it's worthwhile saying that we're very deliberately, Andy and I have made the decision here not to uh, relitigate the nature of the collection of the, at the British Museum. We both have, have discussed this in the past, and we tend to talk for hours when we start. So, so, so we're trying to stick to the timeline of events and the implication of those events. Um, but this was a Danish art collector, who uh, Dr. Uh, Itai Gredel, uh, who um, supposedly uh, identified this this uh, this material being sold on eBay. Now, at this point, was was it clear? It was uh, apparently clear. Yes, it was becoming clear who this person might be. But we're not going to name them, are we? In this in this episode, we're not going to name them because um, there is still a live police investigation, and um, it, uh, although this person has been identified in in various media outlets um we've decided uh not to for the time being mm. um suffice to say though they they are identified as a senior curator at the british museum so that's right this, this wasn't person, a caretaker yeah. or a member of the gift no. shop or someone this, who worked behind the scenes as a, as a no. cleaner this was a senior curator unfortunately uh, so in fact senior enough to be um at the um at the point this uh became public the i think the acting head of the greco roman department yeah yeah so you know this is about as you know in in, in a curatorial hierarchy it's as almost as you know as high as you can you mm. can get mm. the the significance though i think of um dr grodel's um intervention was uh by the what the 24th of august so a week after the story first broke mm. Um, the individual had been potentially identified, the individual responsible had been potentially identified. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Rodel said that he informed the British Museum mm. in 2021 mm. uh, that of the name of the person involved and that the person that he had spoken to was the deputy director of the museum, Dr. Jonathan Williams. Right. This is in early 2021. Yeah. So the idea being that 18 months at least before the story becomes public, the British Museum is made aware of it. Mm. It's, also, um, it's also worthwhile just saying at this point as well, the, the mail had identified that the material that was being sold on eBay was valued at upwards of £50,000, but oddly enough was being sold for as little as £40 on, the, uh, on that particular... Um, auction website so th this this complicates matters somewhat in so much as it's not even as though the person uh who has is alleged to be uh, involved in this was actually making a lot of money for this stuff they were seemingly or it was seemingly being sold at a fraction of its value um it's a curious it's a curious situation that's unfolding isn't it there that's right. And the, the Telegraph, in fact, not the mail, had um, linked a Twitter handle and a PayPal account to the suspected perpetrator mm. of, of, the, of the thefts. Mm. Um, but in terms of going back to Dr. Grodel's um, intervention, uh, having put out a very professional press release, uh, a week earlier to try and control the narrative, play down the potential harm to the museum and the museum's reputation. Mm. Um, this particular um, event becoming public blew the whole thing up mm. because Dr. Grodel, um, so made his allegations, the 
then director, Dr. Fisher, Dr. Hardwick Fisher, who we sp spoke about earlier, um, basically uh, hmm. insulted Gödel yeah. and said he was basically telling a, a pack of porkies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and 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 that uh, the museum had behaved impeccably throughout, and that uh, you know whatever. Mm. Um, Dr. Fisher, who had already said that he was leaving the post next year, and it has never been made clear whether the fact whether he was ending his contract and resigning was to do with the fact that this had happened, and they knew this was coming down the track, and they knew they'd need new, new leadership. Mm. Mm. Um, but. Anyway, cut to the chase. Um, after a few days toing and froing, um, Fisher resigned with immediate effect, as did the deputy director of the museum, uh, Jonathan Williams, Dr. Williams. Yeah, that, so that resignation. Basically, at this, at the, sorry. No, that, that resignation was announced on, on the Friday the 25th. Um, so, about, about, about a week or, or, or a little over a week after the story came out. And it's. Uh, uh, it, it, as yeah. you say, it, it is it is curious timing, but it's also unfortunate. Uh, again, as an observer, that the museum's management's first instinct, even if even if if it was in the most you know pure-hearted intentions of protecting the institution, its first instinct was to minimise and, in this case, to lie, if not to downright accuse someone of lying. Um, that's unfortunate, and presumably that's one of the reasons why his resignation was uh, was moved forward by by eighteen months or so. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's um, you know so, something that was in the future suddenly became with immediate effect. And Doctor Williams, um, the the phrases stepped back from his regular duties. Hmm. Um, so you've suddenly got this uh, internationally famous world-class museum and it's in it, it, its senior management team has been decapitated mm. by this event but and, and by the way those individuals and the organization that handled this event so yeah. it's probably one of the worst museum it's become by this point probably one of the most certainly one of the most high profile um museum scandals certainly i'm i, I i'm aware of in recent times mm. so that was friday and then over the weekend, mm -hmm. we saw uh, Mr. George Osborne, formerly uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer uh, for a previous conservative, conservative coalition government, um, who is now the chairman of the British Museum. That is not the same as, as the position that um, Hartwig Fisher uh, occupied. Um, he said that some of the treasures missing from its collections have started to be recovered already. This is on a, a sort of a prime slot on British political television on a Sunday morning. Um, yeah. And he said, uh, also speaking to BBC Radio 4's Today programme, uh, the former Chancellor explained why the museum has not yet released a list of the items which were reported missing, stolen or damaged earlier this month. Uh, do we know? Do we know what what the the tone of these these interventions were? Because it, it feels as though, uh, well, I think as you said to me, um, George Osborne is a is a is a political animal, uh, and, and he definitely doesn't want to be left holding the bag on this. So, uh, did, did, did this? What did what what did you make of of him turning up and coming out on the Sunday following the resignation of uh, Hardwick Fisher? Okay, yes, George Osborne is an absolutely to his fingernails a political animal. Mm. Um, he's extremely well connected. Uh, he was a political appointment. The chair of the British Museum is a political appointment mm. approved by the Department for Culture, Media and Sport and therefore the government. Mm -hmm. um, and the, you know, the, the, the chair is normally put there to do a job for the government handling liaison, yeah, but also if there's anything, you know, to, uh, and, and anything difficult, they're the point person. Mm. Um, up until now, his tenure has been most uh, notable for the inching towards a possible solution with Athens over the uh, location, uh, for the future location of the Parthenon Marbles, mm -hmm. where Osborne appears to be moving towards some kind of rapprochement and arrangement whereby the marbles are returned to Athens with some sort of fudge over the British Museum Act, which prevents them being permanently given to anybody else. Mm. Mm. Um, all of a sudden, he's involved in this real-time scandal. Um, now, he immediately 
becomes the point person. He's the first person quoted in that original 16th of August press release. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and as things go on, you know, particularly once both the director and the deputy director are no longer available, um, he's the person that's fronting up on the, uh, on, on the media. That's why he appears on television that Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, a high, it's a high profile um, piece of attempted news management to try and regain control, regain trust. And uh, it, it, he's the only person left to do it. Mm. That the museum's got left to do it. And in the, in the meantime, um, Fisher has been, um, again, you can imagine this uh, resignation uh, statement being drafted. Fisher has resigned in a way that is, um, should leave Osborne and the governors, if not in the clear, at least without the immediate heat on them. Because Fisher says in his, in, in his statement, it is evident that the British Museum did not respond as comp comprehensively as it should have in response to the warnings of 2021 and to the problem that has now fully emerged. Mm. The responsibility for that failure must ultimately rest with the director. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was the, um, you know, the old uh, British Army uh, bottle of whiskey and a revolver. <laughs> yeah. <You know? laughs> um, he yeah. didn't have much choice. No, no. Um, and that's designed to clear the decks. And in fact, very quickly thereafter. Um, well, actually, so Osborne... before, sorry, before we get on to, on to the, the people who, who came in, can, uh, can we just briefly also mention at the same time that weekend, uh, people were coming forward, for example, a former curator was suggesting that actually the British Museum had, quote, incredibly p poor, no, as they said, incredi incredibly pure, incredibly poor uh, security standards. Uh, that that they're not that they weren't surprised had led to thefts. Um, the now ex curator in a different department has claimed that scores of other conservators, specialists, and researchers may go into any storeroom in the same week, or or even on the same day, with no oversight of cataloging, leaving invaluable items at risk. The British Museum, this is a quote, really does need to review its security policy. The former member of staff who did not wish to be named told the Independent. So people were coming forward criticising um, the BM. Uh, there was also a story, I think, from many years ago where, where uh, I think, a journalist, didn't they? They claimed that they'd gone into Sunday a storeroom. Sunday Times journalist, yeah. Yeah, gone into a yeah. storeroom and um, removed a foot uh, from the museum and then took it back again. I, I, I should add, hard. this this is this is a disarticulated foot from a, a Greek statue. It wasn't yes. somebody's foot, and it wasn't an actual human foot. Um, but yeah, it was um, it was literally sort of um, sneak it out in your in, in a carrier bag uh, yeah. job. It was done. It was done deliberately by the newspaper investigating museum security. Yeah, yeah. So all of this stuff was sort of coming to the fore, floating around, and, and uh, it sounds as though, uh, well. The, Hopefully, hopefully the British Museum was starting to identify that they should have been making some serious changes. And with that in mind, uh, initially a new deputy director was announced, um, weren't they? Well, this, 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 well, this all happened very quickly. Hmm. Um, this is this happened the um, I think the the, the, the Thursday and then the Saturday following Osborne's hmm. appearance on uh, yeah on, hmm. um, on 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 television. First of all, um, on on the on the thirty first of August. Uh, they announced that they've made an internal appointment for deputy director. And that's um, the museum's uh, then director of scientific research, uh, who's actually an archaeologist, um, Carl Heron. Um, and the statement that went with that said, Carl is a highly respected authority within the museum, so I'm sure you will all wish him well in the, in the position. Um, and um, George Osborne circulated a an email to staff uh, assuring everybody that um, the search for an interim director was well underway. Now, I think he probably knew more than he was telling in that letter. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly, um, Heron, um, who's he says, is a highly respected bioarchaeologist, expert in dating. Um, he was a British Museum insider, um, but only relatively recently, 2016. Uh, previously, he was an academic at the University of Bradford. Mm. Um, which obviously has a, a high reputation for the archaeological sciences. Mm. Um, so that, that, that this is that that is that is the steady the ship uh, appointment to reassure the staff. 
Yeah, so that's that's someone grabbing the wheel. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. The, the, yeah the, the, this uh, the, the, this uh, you know, this former politician and um, one-time newspaper editor and various other jobs hmm. um, isn't the person in charge and fronting up for us anymore. We've got a professional back, hmm. and in fact. Um, just a few days later, on the second of September, hmm. they announced what I think Osborne probably already knew by the by the time they appointed Heron. Hmm. Um, they appointed an interim director, um, a man called Mark Jones. Yeah. And now, again, um, Mark Jones has a glowing CV as a museum professional. Um, he'd um, he well, directed. Maybe he, he directed both the VNA. He, I mean, he he trained at the Courtauld Institute of Art. He was he had been at the British Museum in from the seventies to the ninth to nineteen ninety when he was in the Department of Coins and Medals. That's his expertise. Mm, mm. But then he became the director of National Museums of Scotland, and then the Victorian Albert, and in particular at the Victorian Albert Museum, that famous museum in South Kensington, um, he oversaw a a, a, a change plan worth 120 million pounds um, in the um, in the first decade of, of this century. Mm. Um, so he's got huge experience of running major museums and major museums in times of change. Yeah. So in terms in terms of a CV for somebody you want in a situation like that, um, then he absolutely fits the headhunters tick boxes, tick box sheet. Um, yeah. I think it has to be said, obviously, he's, he's somebody of impeccable experience and reputation. He's also in his early 70s and was pretty much uh, retired from active uh, museum work and has been for some time. He's uh, very active on you know eminent boards of uh, management and things like that, but not day-to-day -day running. And I think the suggestion is that, yes, he's absolutely the right kind of person for this kind of interim appointment in this kind of crisis. Yeah. Um but he also happened to be available. Yeah. He was also quoted as saying that he he has vowed to restore the reputation of uh, of the institution that is the British Museum. Yeah. Um, and, that, and, and that has to be said, you know, in a sense, by this stage, the artifacts themselves, and we still haven't had a full list of what went missing. Well, and, um, and that's one of my questions. Tell me in further, maybe they don't know. Uh, no, we can't. No, okay. But but um, I think, in a sense, that particular part of the ar argument has become academic and also a case for the police. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, because the real issue now, as you've just identified with that with that quote when when Samart took over, um, is the the museum's reputation. It, well, it's not just in the it, it the museum's reputation. It's become a laughing stock. It has, yeah. it has. A watching brief is a formal program of observation and investigation to record and report on notable discoveries on an archaeological site. As part of our ongoing watching brief, Andy and I work hard to bring you the best, the worst, and sometimes the more quirky happenings from the world of archaeology. We aim to provide a space where voices can be heard, opinions shared, and sometimes truth spoken to power. If you believe in the work we do, please consider supporting us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per month. Thank you. This is where I think our conversation may briefly get a little spicy. Uh, I think it's also to do with not just its reputation, but also its 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 raison d'être. You know, why why does it exist, and to what extent can it continue to exist in its current form? Uh, has been raised by this this problem because, very very briefly, the British Museum for years now 
if not decades, if not hundreds of years, has been telling the world it's a safe place to store much of the world's treasures. Not that long ago, Rishi Sunak, our Prime Minister, was quoted as saying that this is where the world stores, I think he used the word assets, where the world keeps its assets and we, we show their assets back to the world. It um, wasn't quite... I th- it wasn't you, quite assets, yeah. but it was stuff. No. It was things. I mean, I, 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 that's not a direct quote, but it was basically he was, he was saying that the BM is a place where the world can come and see material that's been recovered from around the world. Um, and that's partly uh, a political stance. The British government likes the British Museum for that reason. It is a source of soft, if not slightly hard, power around the world. I, I'd just like to read that Rishi Sunak quote in full. Actually, this is this is this is uh, this is quote, and he's he was commenting on the uh, recent speculation that uh, George Osborne was moving towards a settlement with, uh, with with the government of Greece and mm-hmm. the Parthenon Museum in Athens about the Parthenon marbles. Um, Sunak said, "We share their treasures with the world, and the world comes to the UK to see them. Mm. The collection of the British Museum is protected by law." and we have no plans to change it. Mm. Now, that second sentence about the collection of the British Museum being protected by law, as I've said many times when we've discussed these issues, Mm -hmm. is absolutely true. The British Museum Act prevents the Board of Governors divesting itself of parts of the collection. You know, the collection is protected. Although, can I just very, very quickly say, but of course, if I was safe from Greece, I would say, of course, the British Museum Act does that because the government wants to keep hold of stuff in the British Museum. I'll leave that there. But, but you know, it's, and until, it's, yeah, like, and it's until, a and, and circular and then, argument, isn't it? Uh, well, no, it's not a circular argument. It's an argument of fact. The law, the British, you, you know, UK law, English law, yeah. as regards to the British Museum, is a fact that anybody who engages in this argument has to deal with. Yes. I'm yeah. not, no, I'm not, I'm not saying it's a good thing. No, no. I'm not no. saying that everything should remain in perpetuity because of this Act of Parliament passed in the early 1960s. Yeah. Mm. But... It's it is a fact, and it has to be part of the discussion. Yeah, whatever you think of it, yeah. um, the the political part of it is where Sunak says we have no plans to change it. Mm. That again acknowledges that this is a political that you know the status of the collection is a political issue. You talked about soft power just now. Mm. Uh, he talks about the world. The, the world comes to the UK to see them. You know, it's. It, it, it's millions of visitors a year visit Bloomsbury and visit that collection. Mm. You know, you go there on a you, you go there on a, a, a on a on a weekday in the tourist season, and and many of the galleries are rammed. Mm. And that's a you know, in the many respects, that's a wonderful thing to see. You know, it, it, this culture is on display, and it is on display for free, even if you're not a UK taxpayer who's actually paying for the upkeep of the place. Yeah. But that comes or should come with great responsibility. If you want to tell the world, no, 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 you can't possibly look after this. We are the best place to do that for now, um, if not forever. Then you have to be trustworthy and transparent and you have to have clear protocols in place. And what this this, this situation has revealed is lack security, patchy um, record keeping in terms of what's actually in the archives of the museum, access... Uh, to areas which goes unchecked um, and also a tendency to protect the institution ahead of being transparent to the world. After all, the British Museum is where an awful lot of the world's stuff is and a lot of people around the world are very interested in how well that stuff is being looked after. Now, I'm, try- I'm, trying, to, I'm trying to word this in the most calm and, um, and concise way possible, but it, it can be summed up in a, a couple of different headlines. This is a newspaper, uh, a Greek newspaper, you won't be surprised, um, uh, which has a quote, um, the British Museum, uh, well, no, sorry, not a quote, it's an opinion piece. The British Museum has lost the argument that the Parthenon marbles are safer in London. That's one headline. Uh, another headline, this is um, from, as you would frame it, Welsh nationalists, but certainly people in Wales, who are suggesting that artefacts should be returned to Wales if the British Museum isn't safe, says Liz Savile-Roberts. Uh, yes, a Welsh yes is there, who's the Plaid Cymru, the Welsh Nationalist Party's exactly, leader yeah. in uh, Westminster. Perfectly yeah, just, you know, she's perfectly yeah. at liberty to say that. And even even the Ch- Chinese state media called for a return of museum uh, objects in the British Museum following uh, a TikTok a Chinese TikTok video that blew up on the app um, that uh, fueled calls for a re- museum to return artifacts. This is a, mu- a video that uh, was um, 
it's just like what's been described as a bizarre um viral video about a chinese teapot trying to escape from the british museum uh, that had uh, revitalized this row alongside this scandal or this growing scandal um, about the stuff that's in that building now as i say we, we don't want to litigate or relitigate the um the contents of the museum per se i strongly believe that there are that, that, that every in, every individual instance of a claim should be examined and should be given its day in court uh but that that's sort of to one side but the but the broad question here can be summed up by the guardian as as this this opinion piece does with the headline being a victim of theft might help the british museum reflect on returning its own swag it's not it's not been a good look has it for the british museum and really across the board this has been you could say an excuse to put the boot in but you could also say it's been an ironic uh, an ironic event uh, in in the history of 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 a collection that uh, that that has has controversy surrounding it. I suppose what I would say as one final point, though, is that by no means is the entire content of the British Museum stolen. There are people online who have been saying, "How can you steal something that's already been stolen?" We don't know uh, if the material actually was stolen. And most, I suspect, of the British Museum collection has been um, has been handed over to the museum voluntarily um despite there being some very notable exceptions to that anyway you've let me ramble on for a while andy what do you have to say there are complexities here that i think um look i people who believe that artifacts in the british museum which were stolen and some undoubtedly were even under modern you know definitions of the time let alone mm. current law and practice mm. there are undoubtedly issues there that need to be negotiated mm. at the same time i think it is uh while it's completely understandable why people are doing it um this to say that stuff isn't you know major items aren't and particularly major art item, items that are on display to everyone who can get to Bloomsbury and can, you know, climb up, the, you know, go up those stairs and, or up, you know, up in that lift and visit those galleries. It's not those items that have been stolen. It's items from the, it's items from the stores that are very rarely interrogated by anybody. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, um, we don't know the motivation for why whoever took them took them. But the gallery security hasn't isn't under question here. Well, except except, and this this is this is where an irony has been pointed out again by by people viewing this, that the the curator in question, by being given the role as head of Greek Greek and Roman stuff in the museum, yeah. was effectively put in charge of the Parthenon marbles. Now now yes. now if if you just state this as alleged fact, shall we say? or as alleged mm -hmm. action, that means yeah. a senior curator who sold stuff from the British Museum on eBay was in charge of the Parthenon marbles. That is an awful, awful sentence. Now, as you say, it's not, it's not like he could, he's not like he could pocket the Parthenon marbles and sell them, but it's, 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 it's just the, the ethics here, the ethical argument it looks very there's, shaky on those. There's, that's true to an extent, but I think, we, we, you know, we don't yet know who knew what, when. It's been alleged in the Telegraph, which was later picked up in the mail, hmm. that uh, the, the that senior managers, a senior manager, had been told that this particular person was potentially removing and selling artefacts from the collection. Mm -hmm. Uh, what we don't know is whether that information was actioned in any way, whether it was even passed on. Mm. Um, so it's, uh, and again, you know, large, or, large organizations, there's a lot of inertia. It, it you know, it may well be, well, you know, a, 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 an internal vacancy opened up, the logical person to fill it was this particular person. So technically, while their name had been tipped off to management as potentially removing artifacts and flogging them on eBay, um, they were also coincidentally at the same time by a complete <laughs> cock up put in charge technically of the path and the marble. I just don't buy it. I just don't buy it. And if that is the case, then the British Museum is incompetent. 
you know, and can be painted as incompetent quite rightly by people across the globe. That and I'm not that, going to argue with that. It, it's well, okay. There you go. At, at a base level, it's gross incompetence that someone who might have been linked to selling stuff on eBay gets into that. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's, just, it's Which, not good. Yeah, and 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 that is, and I think we can probably speculate reasonably that that's why Dr. Fisher no longer has a job. Well, at the British Museum. Well, yeah, but then again, we are, in fact, fishing in the dark until more information comes forward. The fact that the management on this particular occasion was found woefully wanting hmm. doesn't mean that the institution itself is illegitimate. No. And that's what some people have been arguing. Some people have been arguing that. And, and some people have been arguing for as long as I've been alive that the British Museum needs to be burned down. Um, yes. But to be fair, I... I, I Prefer preferably once the once stuff has been empty. taken out yes. and not sold on, and not yes. sold on either. Um, yeah. But it's... Uh, and the thing is, I, I don't believe that. I think that there is a place for the British Museum. Uh, and as we've discussed before, for example, with the with the Benin bronzes, I would like to see really high-quality 3D-printed copies of those things on display in the museum and to find a way to long-term loan or whatever it is uh return them to to nigeria you know as, as a gesture of goodwill in this post-brexit post-imperial britain that that we have on the on the global stage you know have a bit of humility and and, and contrition on that front but but all of that is complex and it's all and i recognize it's all tied up with uh with legal matters that that are big and small with questions as to where exactly this material goes and also as well i mentioned earlier how a great many of the the smaller collections that comprise the, the larger collection of the bm were donated um but there's also an issue there where sometimes small collections will contain material that it's not entirely clear how that material ended up in that small collection. So, well, I think it's fair, it's fair to say that uh, I mean, the, uh, uh, of the material that is alleged to have been removed and alleged to have been sold, um, it has been speculated, or not, although as I understand it, not so far confirmed, that it come, uh, some of it at least comes from a collection that was put together by somebody completely unconnected with the museum in the 18th century hmm. and then hmm. eventually came to the museum so so in, that, so, so in that sense the closer you look at any collection of things never mind the british museum hmm. possibly the harder it's going to be to ascertain the, the actual origin of all of those things yeah. so so there are there are complications and in many ways an institution like the bm being free to access and also as well existing even if the catalogue isn't complete, existing in a way that can safely store material for the most part mm. is no bad thing. That stuff has to be somewhere. Um, and we're not talking about the galleries mm. there. I'm talking about the millions of items that, that they have in warehouses uh, or, in, in, or in storage. Um, but I suppose just to come back to the heart of this matter, okay, you know, we've, we've gone over that timeline. We've basically hit a bit of a, a holding pattern now that the interim... Um, uh, director has been put in charge and presumably the police investigation is going ahead um, as we'll, far as we know yeah yeah and we'll hear more about it hopefully in the near future yeah uh, or not too distant future hopefully um can i think it's important given that we do have an international audience on watching brief mm. i think it's important to recognize that um that it, it's entirely reasonable for people at the very least to feel as though that the museum has uh is is on somewhat ironic if not downright shaky ground with a story like this coming out the problem is though the, the problem is though and and this is where i'll hand over to you is that i do recognize also and we should recognize that people are people you know archaeologists and i've said this elsewhere were not priests we're not ordained we're not we don't have yeah. vows that we have that keep us on the straight and narrow we can be tempted and we do do things wrong and yeah it is probably wrong to judge the museum on the actions of one individual uh but i i'm still for my part personally yeah personally and professionally i find it embarrassing frustrating and ironic to the point of of nauseating that this has happened at the british museum and then the instinct was to make out that 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 people who were flagging it were likely exaggerating, if not lying, I think that's deeply unfortunate. Considering the BM tries to tell the world that it's a safe place, in that sense, hopefully a transparent place, to store 
these cultural items from across the world. Right. I, mean, I think just to, to, to wind this up, I, th mm. I think it's important to keep this in perspective. Mm. As I say, I completely understand why people like the Chinese and the Greeks and anybody else who has a, you know, the uh, Plaid Cymru, mm. anybody else who has a, who, who, who has a, wants to press a claim to artifacts in the British Museum collection. I can understand why they're taking this op opportunity to do it. If I was in their position, I'd be doing the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to downplay the reputational disaster that this is. Mm. But as many museum curators have said about this, it's very easy to get distracted because the real issue here is one of resources and mm. also understanding of museum practice. Mm. You know, the British Museum has, it thinks, because it hasn't got a complete catalogue, and that's come as a shock to a lot of people, Yeah, has, some, has several million items in its, in, it, in its archive. And it is virtually impossible now, after 250 approaching 300 years for that museum to fully catalog its collection and know the provenance of every single item. Mm. Mm. Um, even just now, bringing it down to UK politics, and we mentioned George Osborne's collect connection with um, UK Correct. politics. Uh -huh. <laughs> connection <laughs> with UK politics. No, look, for me, yeah, it, it's hugely ironic that mm. the British Museum in, is in this position over the uh, where, where, where the person who, however briefly, was responsible for the security of the Parthenon marbles and policy over the Parthenon marbles um, is alleged to have removed other artefacts that are contemporaneous, possibly, with the Parthenon marbles from the archive without permission mm. and mm. possibly even sold them. Mm. Supremely ironic. Mm. But there's another very rich irony in this, which is that along with pretty much every other cultural institution in the UK, the British Museum funding has fallen substantially since 2010, when the current Conservative government was first elected under David Cameron. Mm. And the person who was the architect of what was called austerity which led to, for example, um, Historic England losing something like 35% of its central government funding mm -hmm. almost mm -hmm. overnight. The person who was the architect of that was one Chancellor of the Exchequer, George Osborne. Yeah. yeah. And if, the, if, if it is found that one of the reasons this was able to, that enabled this to happen was out-of-date security and lack of staff to supervise mm. i think it's supremely ironic that the person with the giant pooper scooper is the person that was responsible for the huge pile in the first place now of course speaking of pooper scoopers we, we should acknowledge that uh, uh first of all um the unnamed in our broadcasts curator and his family have denied any wrongdoing at this juncture uh, again it's a police investigation and 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 what comes out of that will come out of that and we'll report on it when we when we can uh, but also as well osborne being that the man who 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 laid the ground for the poop and now being in charge of picking up the poop <laughs> uh is not the only issue here uh, everyone who's been linked with investigating this issue are british museum insiders or former uh, board members is this a case of the british museum wanting to mark its own homework and to what extent should we or more to the point the world uh be can uh, be satisfied with that that's a really good point and um and, and in fact it's something i should have picked up earlier when we talked about that original british museum press release because um by having a former board member at least co-leading hmm the inquiry. I mean, I, th I think we have to accept that the head of British Transport Police is a person of integrity and experience in investigations. 
Well, I should, um, I should, I should ask about that. This is something I should have asked earlier. Why, why the transport police? Again, we don't know. Right. Um, there are, you know, so, so, it, so in that sense, it could be pertinent, but it also could just be a, like having a, a neutral referee in an international football match. Yeah. 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 Mm. Um, yeah we, 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 we may well see in, in, in due course that um, there, there, there are good reasons for that. I mean, uh, yeah, often, often on these kinds of inquiries, you do have some kind of um, uh, police expertise, shall mm. we say, whether it's current or, or, in, or in the recent past. Mm. Um, and obviously in this kind of circumstance, it, it, it's useful, but, um, as I say, I, I think the fact that both have been appointed by the British Museum board. Now we, again, we don't know whether they, uh, ran those names past the DCMS before mm -hmm. they announced them. Um, it's possible, but it's equally possible that, that, that they didn't, that the DCMS just let them get on with it. I mean, I think whatever happens, I suspect this actually won't be the only, uh, the only inquiry. Um, the other issue they're going to have is with a, with the police investigation going ahead, if it results in charges and a formal court process, then that is probably going to block certainly the publication of any results of any inquiry until after court proceedings have been completed. Yeah, yeah. And uh, not for the first time. I can't help but think that the wheels of justice can sometimes be very frustrating to observe, can't they? Because people want answers, but those answers have to come out in the right way and they have to be the correct answers as well, don't they? Uh, and, and that's the correct answers as in, you know, morally and, morally and intellectually correct, not the correct according to one particular party. You know, yeah. one person's correct answer about you know the British Museum and the Parthenon marbles is not going to no, be someone no, no, else's I'm not, I'm not. I'm not. But no, we're, no, we're not. We're not litigating the collection. I was talking about about <laughs> in this case a criminal investigation. You know the the sure. what the the outcome of that investigation has to be weighed and measured impartially, and that that takes time. That's right. It, yeah, it has to. It has to. First of all, it has to reach court. It has to go through a court process, and then potentially it has to go through an appeal process as well. Hmm. So uh, and and given that the British court system is currently suffering from significant backlogs, even in major cases like, you know, rape and murder, hmm. uh, basically don't hold your breath. It's not going, we're not going to see a rapid solution to this. Yeah. That's a, yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. Will we, will we return to this as and when we know more, do you think? Uh, uh, and also, I, I suppose the reason why I'm asking that is to what extent is there value and worth in discussing whatever happens next to the alleged, uh, the person who is alleged to be involved in these actions? Um, is it a case of we'll discuss this when this person might has or hasn't been prosecuted, perhaps, mm -hmm. and, and go from there? Because in that sense, I'm not sure that there's any value in drawing it out like a gossip column in that sense uh, yeah. because because we do need to deal with with facts and also with for example when they eventually have a full list uh hopefully that comes out of the horse's mouth if the horse is in fact involved yeah look i i think the important thing yeah we need to debate museum ethics but we also need to debate alongside museum ethics museum resourcing mm. and the training of staff and the value of staff mm. and the fact that staff who are incredibly experienced with deep, deep knowledge built up over careers, um, are still earning relative to other parts of even the public se sector, let alone um, you know, the, the, the private sector and other, other, other areas of society, mm. relatively little, particularly in the capital. Mm. You know, we're, we're, um, and, uh, 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 and so staffing, resourcing, all those things need to be a part of it. We, yeah, we need to understand how it happened, what happened, what's gone missing, why this person, whoever they are, did them, what interactions they had with, mm. you know. I mean, again, the, the unspoken thing in this is, and, and it's co cropped up time and time again, there's the scandals in the States at the moment over um, museums that bought tainted artefacts in the last couple of decades mm. where people have understood heritage crime and trafficking far more than ever in the past and cared about it far more than ever in the past mm. uh, particularly for uh, th th there's you know particular cases for example related to uh, uh, artifacts from Cambodia mm. um, where American museums bought tainted artifacts 
from academic dealers. And it's that interaction between academic experts and dealing artifacts, de de dealing in art objects that, again, we don't talk about very much. Well, and also in that sense, the prestige of having a collection. So in the 50s and 60s in particular, museums in America were going out trying to fill out sections of their museum and buying in bulk. Oh, we need something from this part of the map. We need something from that part of the map. Now, obviously, the BM had already benefited from going around the world doing a lot of gathering already, for better or worse, and in various ways. Um, but, yeah, there is there, there are questions about that. Do museums need... Does a collection need to exist in that way for that reason? That's a that's a very legitimate question, um, and it's one. And I think I think ultimately this this is I guess my final word on on this for now is that, I, as I've said before, I, I've expressed frustration with the fact that I can't mention the BM on social media without being bombarded, typically by fairly smarmy um, sounding people who go all sort of like oh it's just like a, you know it's a joke it's become a joke the British Museum is a joke as to yeah. as to being the place where the world stolen stuff is. Um, uh, and on the one hand, that's it's a gross misunderstanding as to what the BM actually is and how what the collection actually is comprised of. But on the other hand, it's a very real, everyday distraction from these other big issues that do affect the BM as well. I'm not saying, you know, there's nothing to talk about at the British Museum, but this broader collection question, this broader socio-cultural um, showing and the, the legitimacy of learning you know, type a type object, a type artifact, for example, in engineering, is necessary to learn. You need to have mm. standardized weights, for example, to be able to refer to and so on and so forth. And you know, it's a complex issue that that while while the BM is is cast as an easy cartoon character to point at, a cartoon villain, um, the broader serious issues, and as you say, of funding not least, aren't being addressed. Mm. Tangentially last night i started a conversation on uh, on a facebook thread uh talking about volunteering in archaeology and uh and that was an interesting one because it, it uh, what you know there was broadly in that sense two sides to the question um or two sides to the two of the responses uh but uh the, the central question is to uh, or the statement by what someone who seemed to be a manager in the se in, in the sector say said something along the lines of volunteering is the backbone of the heritage quote industry in Britain. Without volunteering, then so much of our in of our in industry wouldn't occur. I think that's part of the problem here, and you've just been alluding to that. This this whole thing of it, we are underfunded, and yes. and as much as as the as the British government enjoys having the bm as a as a as a thing it can control and the contents that it can it can it can it can make claims to um if they want that we also need to pay for it and we need to pay to look after it it as well it, it in the first instance but more broadly i think the sector at large so yeah while while the cartoon character is while the cartoon villain with the waxed mustache is being pointed at we are ignoring those underlying structural issues, definitely. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, in the end, although on the surface, some things are really straightforward mm. to look at. You know, stealing is wrong mm -hmm. and, that, and should be uh, mitigated if it's discovered and, if necessary, punished. Mm. Um, the circumstances under which the stealing takes place might well be very complicated. Yeah, yeah, and we just don't know at this point. And we just don't know, absolutely. No. Mm. Well, folks, that has been a watching brief. That's been our deep dive into what we know about what's been happening at the BM so far in this instance. Uh, please do comment below. Please do keep your comments uh, civil. And as far as possible, try to address some of the issues that we've been talking about. I, I don't think we need yet another flame war over whether or not the BM is an evil place. For the most part, the people who live and work in and around those halls are good, uh, principled people who, uh, who, who I've, in private conversations I've had, do work towards and are, do, are, are, and are always aware of issues of, for example, repatriation. But they are bound by le legal restrictions and by a slow-moving 
sen- uh, set of ethics and and broader cultural geopolitical concerns that 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 aren't easy to negotiate. Um, so, yeah, keep the conversation uh, respectful as far as possible. Uh, do we have any sense of what next week's watch and brief might be about, Andy? <sighs> no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Because there was, uh, there was no, something that and, popped and, up and, over the weekend. And, and, unless, wasn't there? And, and, unless there are suddenly charges in this or any other. Uh, uh, no, obviously, there's a lot of stories bubbling under at the moment. Um, the uh, this, the row over Scampton is still going on. Mm-hmm. Um, the um, coming for, coming forward in the in, in the next few months, we've got the uh, Stonehenge Judicial Review, the Scampton Judicial Review. Um, you know, you know what I'm going to ask, don't you? Oh, not that one. Yeah. <laughs> can we? Can we please? Please, sir. If I, if I, if I, if I've got time to write it. Okay, everyone at home, send Andy time. We need to give him time. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, guys. Thanks for watching. Uh, until next time. Take care. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs>